Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, presentation about targeted cultural heritage and civilian violence in the Syrian war. Uh, unfortunately, a very current topic, uh, not often as widely discussed as we think it should be. Um, today, we have Dr. Michelle Fabiani, who is a professor of criminal justice at the University of New Haven. And we'll also have a Gregory Wattsworth, a doctoral candidate in criminal justice, and Rachel Swanson, who is a graduate student in forensic technology. Uh, Michelle, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Uh, we're thrilled to be here today. We are all components of this larger project. And so we're going to be talking today about some work from my lab, Curia, um, that is trying to understand the microdynamics of conflict, specifically looking at the Syrian war. And most of the work that I focus on has to do with the intersection between transnational crime and cultural heritage violence. And so this is a very important intersection of those two, where we are attempting to understand how civilian fatal attacks and cultural heritage attacks are related in the context of this conflict. So to begin with, our first, our first presentation, we're gonna go through the context and what the project has looked at so far and where we're going. And then the next presentation will focus in on an important data set that we uh, compiled. So for context, the Syrian conflict, which is still ongoing, has, from a cultural heritage perspective, two very enduring questions. Could the destruction and targeted violence aimed at cultural heritage during the height of the war have been operationalized to prevent targeted civilian fatalities? So this stems from a sociological argument that the destruction and targeted attacking of cultural heritage serves as a prelude to potential genocide. Um, the other question here is, were civilians and cultural heritage jointly attacked uh, during the height of the conflict? To understand a little bit about the Syrian conflict, we can look at its history. So starting in 2011, we saw anti-Assad protests escalating to a war between the regime and anti-government rebel groups, which then evolved in 2013, where the Islamic State began seizing territory in Syria. Then from 2014 to 2017, which is broadly considered the height of the conflict, a large coalition sought to defeat ISIS using both air and ground operations. Since ISIS's supposed defeat in 2017, this broader conflict has continued. What this very brief overview implies for us analytically is that this is a really messy conflict. There are multiple overlapping campaigns and stages and a shifting cast of actor groups, allegiances, and ideologies at play, which would form the motivation behind any particular set of attacks. Why do we care about civilians and cultural heritage in civil wars? Well, from a civilian violence perspective, it's been argued that it's used to cleanse territories of heterogeneous populations. It's used to force concessions between different sides, a way of controlling the territory via the population. And it is a form of terrorism in and of itself. In terms of cultural heritage, we see it as a mechanism for financing terrorism and subsequent conflict. We see it as an argument, as I mentioned, the preamble to genocide. And it's also a form of propaganda and ritualization of the conflict, which helps it to endure. Finally, there are some who argue it is an explicit form of cultural genocide and ethnocide, as these physical remnants of culture are destroyed. In the Syrian conflict specifically, we see civilian attacks in the form of the Syrian government being accused of using chemical weapons against areas where the oppositional forces had strongholds, the Islamic State targeting specific cultural groups whose ideology differed from theirs, 
as well as the Turkish military operations specifically targeting Syrian Kurds. And from a cultural heritage perspective, we know that key cultural sites were used as battlegrounds, for example, Aleppo. And the Islamic State granted licenses and permission to loot archaeological sites throughout the country as a way of um, building revenue for themselves. There is also an argument that cultural genocide through the targeted destruction of heritage occurred in Syria, especially when it comes to the either legitimate or fake and propagandized destruction of objects from museums, uh, which if the art object was destroyed and it was something that was from a culture that whose ideology disagreed with ISIS's, that's a pretty effective way of promoting their ideology over this other historical legacy. What we're doing here is trying to dig in at a micro level. We know that violence is not uniformly distributed during conflicts, and we know that location characteristics will inform or influence a strategic decision during battle. We also know that civil war violence can spread, it can diffuse, and it can escalate spatially and temporally. And so when we incorporate our knowledge about hot spots and how they shift over space and time, this leads us to really have to think carefully about how we go about understanding what is going on in a conflict from a modeling perspective. We also know that violence here represented as attacks against civilians and cultural heritage is not uniformly distributed and it was not uniformly distributed in the Syrian war, which means we have to think about this all very carefully analytically. Um, so our research questions that we focus on for this one is our two ones. First, are fatal attacks and civilians on civilians and attacks on cultural heritage co-located spatially and temporally? And second, what can spatial temporal patterns of fatal attacks on civilians and cultural heritage tell us about the location and diffusion of violence in the Syrian war? And I'm gonna have Gregory, turn it over to Gregory for the next bit. Thank you, Dr. Fabiani. So to answer these research questions, specifically focusing more on this first research question about uh, the co-location of fatal attacks on civilians and cultural heritage, uh, we're drawing heavily from an analysis conducted by Braithwaite and Johnson. In their original methodology, they were looking at the spatial temporal clustering of uh, counterinsurgency activity, specifically in Baghdad during the uh, Iraqi insurgency. They had 26 weeks that they looked at between January 1st and June 30th in 2005. And their analysis specifically looked at two perspectives, this risk heterogeneity, where patterns of crime can be described in these time-stable models. Specifically for them, that would be that uh, counterinsurgency activity would be concentrated in select areas across the whole time scale. And this repeat and near-repeat victimization, where crime victimization occur in or near areas with recent prior incidents. So for them, uh, counterinsurgency activity occurring in areas with prior counterinsurgency. The way they answered this original question was by taking the city of Baghdad and subdividing the city into uh, a 64 by 54 set of grid cells, about 3,400 grid cells, and doing this for each of these 26 weeks, forming a Baghdad-shaped space-time cube. And then within each one of these cells, as we can see in this beautiful little equation down here at the bottom, within each one of these grid cells, they measured the presence of this counterinsurgency activity, including a uh, small spatial buffer for two cells adjacent. They measured this ambient population. They considered major infrastructure with major roads and residential roads. They took into account the district and location within the city of Baghdad and even considering this uh, airport garrison where they didn't expect attacks to begin with. For us, we're taking the spirit of this equation that Braithwaite and Johnson gave us and trying to apply it to a new situation with new analogous variables. So for us, we're trying to uh, examine intentional cultural heritage destruction and fatal conflict, specifically in Aleppo during the Syrian war, looking specifically between 2014 and 2016. We have three different hypotheses that we're looking at. 
The first is our risk heterogeneity hypothesis, looking at civilian fatalities and cultural heritage destruction and expecting them to be more likely within the presence of like cultural heritage no strike locations, which we'll talk about a bit later. Infrastructure, specifically roads for us, and greater population density. Our second little hypothesis focuses more in on population density, expecting both cultural heritage and civilian fatalities to occur more in locations with greater population. And this final little hypothesis uh, is our R and R, our repeat and near repeat victimization hypothesis, where cultural heritage and fatalities are expected to be uh, spatially approximate to prior acts of both destruction and fatalities. Now, to look at all these, we have to look at one variable at a time, and we're going to be starting with cultural heritage. But we are trying to eventually build maybe toward a more dynamic model, but there's a lot of computational issues we've come across. Specifically, somehow 100 gigabytes of RAM isn't enough to run our models. I don't understand how, but... And this is a more visual look at what our model looks like. So we have our risk heterogeneity up here at the top with protected locations, populations, and infrastructure. We have our repeat and near repeat through... Uh, prior acts of cultural heritage destruction and fatal attacks, and a couple of other relevant covariates that we're going to be looking at, including the previous actors and the type of conflict occurring, and hopefully eventually looking at this uh, co-location between the first starting off with just cultural heritage, uh, heritage, cultural heritage attacks is what we're going to be looking at first. And get back to you. So for this project, in order to even attempt this, we needed to do some pretty significant open source data quantification. Um, what that means is we had to create the a, a new database of cultural heritage damage and destruction during the Syrian conflict. And we did so by compiling data uh, from an open source compendium uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. And then we had to synthesize that with conflict data that could represent civilian fatalities accurately. And the best one for that is the Uppsala conflict data program data, especially their geo event database. So we incorporate both of these um, main sources into our data. Uh, and then we have our other variables. We are using the same population data as Braithwaite and Johnson, which comes from the land scan um, data from the mm, Oakland National Laboratory. And then we also are creating a no strike list location for targeted for protected places, which Rachel will talk about in a minute, um, as well as several other variables like that Gregory mentioned, like roads. When I want to talk for just a quick second about how we created the cultural heritage data, because that's really a cornerstone of this analysis. The data come from the American School of Oriental Research Cultural Heritage Initiative weekly and or monthly reports that were published during the height of the Syrian conflict. So from 2014 to 2017, this Acer Kai group would acted as functionally intelligence um, collecting agencies for cultural heritage. So each report would incorporate anonymized eyewitness reports, cell phone photos, satellite images, social media, any governmental or NGO documentation, and compile it into a complete report with discrete incidents and embedded links and metadata for all of the sources that they were relying on for their briefings. We then verified every single link and piece of information possible within those reports and use the Berkeley protocol uh, on OSINT for our best practices to guide our work. For That was really important because one of the ways that we had to think about conceptualizing these data has to do with the way we recorded time. These reports included both their report date when it was published to the public, as well as an estimated date of the incident. And at first glance, the report date is more, more complete because it exists for every report. However, when we um, look at them having captured both, we can see that the report date is shifting and like compiling 
the actual incidents. And it's much more of an accurate reflection of when things are reported versus when they actually occurred. So if we had not taken the time to go back and verify the information, we would have a misrepresentation of our data. So this is an indication of how we approached it and how thoroughly we, we worked. We put together um, 11 different types of cultural heritage destruction and uh, coded them throughout all of the documents. And we can see that there's a wide variety of types of destruction that are incorporated in these data. Our analytic approach, once we had all our cultural heritage data combined, is to look at things first descriptively, just to get a sense of what do we have and what does it look like in space and in time at the national level before going down into the city level. Then we conduct a detailed characterization and exploratory analysis at the space-time level uh, for our data, again, starting with cultural heritage, before using those results to inform a partial replication of Braithwaite and Johnson. And as Gregory mentioned, we are aiming towards fully dynamic modeling in the future. Each analytical step here, we looked at separately, spatially, temporally, and then spatio-temporally. We have some key variables that we wanted to oper make clear what our operationalization is. In terms of civilian attacks, we're looking at the number of incidents where any civilian fatalities occurred per month per grid cell. So like Braithwaite and Johnson, we are creating a, a Aleppo-shaped space-time cube. Um, and we also then are capturing the magnitude of civilian fatalities through the sum of the estimated fatalities per month per grid cell, as well as we've coded them for a broad characterization of state, non-state, and other. In cultural heritage attacks, we've recorded our incident date, the number of incidents per month per grid cell, actor, and damage type. As well, uh, these we made sure to triangulate between our two data sets so that our reliability measures on spatial and temporal accuracy and precision are aligned. Well, this is what our data look like at the month level. We can see that there's a wide variation here. Um, we have a little over a thousand cultural heritage incidents over the course of a four year period compared to 13, over 13,000 incidents of civilian fatalities over the same time period. So the scale is just a little bit different. Um, but both have a significant amount of variation per month. They also have a pretty wide uh, spatial distribution over time. So when we break it out over the four years, we can see that cultural heritage attacks and civilian fatalities are unevenly distributed. They change considerably over time. And this is also in relation to our population densities. We found no evidence of correlation when we tried to run our initial descriptives. Um, for that, we ran a, a negative binomial. And then when we look at their time series, we can see that there might be some patterning there. There's a spike in cultural heritage at the beginning of the time period, followed by a little bit some spikes in civilian fatalities, but it's not immediately obvious that there's an AA relationship here. When we look descriptively at co-location, we can see that individually these variables are both highly clustered in space. Um, but when we run them together, the only place where there is any statistically significant evidence of co-location is in Aleppo. So that's one of the reasons why we want to do the partial replication of brief weight in Aleppo. It also is similar to some of the other characteristics um, of Baghdad. Moving on to space-time descriptives, we can see that Aleppo has a high concentration of cultural heritage incidents compared to the rest of Syria. Uh, and it varies over time by actor, as well as um, compared to civilian attacks. We see that those vary over time and space by actor with a significant concentration in Aleppo. And we can see that our cultural heritage attacks also vary by type of damage. This is a sample of the different types of damage um, and different types 
For example, bombings and airstrikes are much more common in Aleppo compared to artillery, which was focused on Damascus, and looting, which concentrated in Idlib and Aleppo. Looking empirically at the spatial means of these variables shows us that we do have to explicitly account for the spatial distribution in our, our subsequent modeling. Fatal civilian attacks has some visible randomness in these means and these graphs, which is great. Cultural heritage attacks seem to be slightly more clustered. And then we can see a much clearer difference in the patterns when we break it out, um, for example, by state actor comparisons. Civilian fatalities doesn't really change. And then cultural heritage attacks by state actors has a very obvious pattern. So we clearly need to account explicitly for a spatial dimension. And in doing so with Braithwaite's approach should help to account for this type of uneven distribution. Um, so what this really shows us is that nationally, we're maybe washing out and everything we need to look at should be demonstrated in Aleppo. Uh, and Gregory's gonna quickly talk about our next steps. Yeah. So next step is moving into Aleppo with just cultural heritage data, uh, applying this kind of modified Braithwaite and Johnson equation to just that city for taking the city, splitting it into grid cells, and within each grid cell, applying both looking for cultural heritage, applying this sort of spatial buffer, maintaining an ambient population measure, similar to how Braithwaite and Johnson did, uh, trying to incorporate that infrastructure measure that Braithwaite and Johnson included. We include this measure for no-strike locations, which was analogous to Braithwaite and Johnson's original garrison measure. And of course, we have these sort of relevant covariates that we're going to try to include in this analysis as well. But of course, we aren't without any of many challenges to this project so far. The biggest one at the moment being uh, this issue with grid cells and neighborhoods, with grid cells not obviously snapping to neighborhoods very nicely, a common issue in any spatial analysis. And of course, um, we have to look at cultural heritage and civilian fatalities uh, separately without a fully dynamic model at the moment. And yeah, that's what we have. We're gonna turn it over now to Rachel so that she can tell you a little bit more explicitly about our the no strike data. Yeah. I am Rachel Swanson. I'm a graduate student here at UNH. Um, and I've got very privileged and very honored to work with Dr. Fabiani on this project and be involved. And I'm very privileged to be here and be able to present for you some of what I did in our project. <clears throat> So as I said before, that this project specifically for the smaller part of the project that I'm looking at for No Strike List is examining the co-location of cultural heritage attacks and civilian fatalities in Syria from the height of the conflict from 2014 to 2017. This specifically what I'm looking at is the focus on how we created our No Strike List for cultural heritage landmarks. So based on the United States uh, DOD definition, it is a list of geographic areas, complexes, or installations not planned for capture or destruction. Attacking these may violate the law of armed conflict or interfere with friendly relations with indigenous personnel or governments, essentially meaning that they're protected by international law. And if there would be any overlap significantly, those actors would have to be held accountable for their actions. Um, it also means that these locations are significant in either civilian, religious sites, archaeological sites, or cultural sites, meaning these are places that are important for any of those reasons. The reason we're looking at no strike lists in relation to civilian fatalities is solely because these locations are supposed to be protected by international law, meaning that these are places that are universally agreed upon that they should not be targeted in any form of conflict meaning they also provide safe locations for civilians to harbor in during these conflicts as an attempt to get away from all the violence. And they both encompass civilian and cultural institutions, essentially meaning that if there is an overlap, it is very important to look at that overlap because it's analytically important. So 
my job was to create a comprehensive no strike list, which is so much fun, but a lot more challenging than you would think. So we essentially broke it down into three main steps. Data co collection, which we reached out to a couple of experts in their field to see if they'd be willing to share their information on what they had about cultural heritage sites in Syria with us. We also did extensive online searches restricted to the conflict timeframe just so that we would avoid temporal bias. And then we broke it down also into data collation, which meaning we synthesized and reconciled locations across all the sources that we had gotten from experts and through open sources. And then we also tri triangulated the locations to validate coordinates and type of sites. And then the last part is more important for as sharing the no strike list, ethics and security. All the site locations are kept secure and are not publicly available. And as with the experts who share their information with us, because these sites cannot be targeted because of their protections, meaning that we can't share them because we don't wanna risk anything bad happening. So my process for this was essentially this. We did site verification, verification where I went through each list that was given to me. There was a set of five and I had to verify every location that was given. Meaning I had to go through and all the coordinates that were given to me, I had to convert them into the correct coordinate system. And then I also had to put them all in one single sheet to be able to observe every location altogether. And then we did data synthesis. Uh, where we appended the variables from each list into a combined data set, and then we included some of the variables from the original list, such as the original names, alternative names, descriptions, sources, and geolocations, just so then all the data would have the accurate information to go along with it. We also had to validate everything, so we cross-referenced through online searching, and then we confirmed, confirmed all the coordinates using Google Earth and ArcGIS Pro, it was a very fun process of having to look at all the coordinates, get them accurate so we could easily go through both. And it ended up being a process where we had to use Google Earth first. <laughs> and then we had to hand code some new variables for to make it completely comprehensive in our list for location types and the data sources so that it could all be related to each other. So ooh. there we go, sorry. Um, so these are just a couple of graphs showing like this, uh, the different data that I was working with and some of the types of variables that I had to create. So we created the type of sites, which just went through and said what the site was, essentially if it was a church, if it was a mosque, if it was a funerary, um, if it was an other site, a ruin, a, a shrine, a unknown site, or a tell, which is a is essentially a mound of land that had some archaeological significance. And then this also shows the count and then how many actual places that we looked at. So our final set had 1,700 points on it. It was a lot and broke my laptop a few times. Uh, and then we also observed what was actually World Heritage Sites that are evaluated as World Heritage Sites nationally. So they go through each of the different um, variables that we created for what type of site they were, and then we broke it down into if they qualified, if they didn't, and then if they're just, we didn't know. And then there was a lot of fun advantages and disadvantages and limitations that we had to work with with this data. A big problem was because of the privacy of this data, we didn't have access to all the full information. Because all these sites are protected, we were very limited on what we could find, what we were given, and what we could verify, solely because a lot of these sites are protected and we couldn't even get accurate coordinates for certain places because of that protection. And then some of the data sets that we were given were just very poorly designed, where they didn't have great did not have great sourcing, didn't have great metadata to be able to look at and find where they got their information, um, but it did help that we were, I got very privileged that Dr. Fabiani has helped me learn how to look and find things accurately because that was very helpful in this process. And because of all that, it was very difficult, but in the end, there was a lot of good things that came out of it as well, getting to see the results of this data and being able to have a comprehensive list so we can actually evaluate what's important is uh, was very rewarding. 
Um, but that is all I have for you guys. So thank you very much for listening. And then thank you for joining and being here. Thank you. Uh, are we ready for the Q&A or is there more presentation? Nope, that's it. We're ready for Q&A. Okay. Uh, first question, it's a bit of a conversation going on in the Q&A. Uh, someone, Sag Sagar Carr says, when it comes to cultural genocide, what are the key encouraging factors behind this crime? And somebody responded, the motivation behind causing all this destruction was the religious belief of the ISIS group, the Islamic State. If I am not wrong, this aspect has been overlooked in the hypothesis. What is your say on this, please? So there's a lot going on there, and uh, I'm very excited that there's conversation happening. Um, motivation behind cultural genocide is slightly more complex than simple, simply um, it went against religious ideology. Um, there's also a tactical element to it. Um, ISIS in particular is an interesting example because they operated both as a terrorist organization and to some extent uh, they tried to set themselves up as a sort of pseudo government. So in, in the context of the Syrian conflict specifically, the role of cultural genocide can serve the purpose of, yes, promoting an ideology and trying to reframe history to promote your own authenticity. It can also serve as a recruitment strategy. If you, so for example, when ISIS went into the Mosul Museum and filmed the quote destruction of statues that were against their ideology, they didn't actually destroy those statues, but they filmed something that was similar and called it that, and then used that as propaganda to try to elicit a reaction from the international community. And then they use that reaction from the international community to generate uh, recruitment and donations and financial support. Meanwhile, they then take the objects themselves and can sometimes sell them on the illicit market to finance their actions. So the, the, motiv the motivations behind something like cultural genocide are complex. Conflict in general is messy and you cannot, from the outside, I would say, or even necessarily from the inside of a conflict, with any degree of confidence, accurately ascribe motivation unless somebody explicitly says it. And even then in the context of ISIS, we have to question what's the motivation behind how they're saying it. Same with the pro-Assad um, documentation we found or the anti-Assad, there's always there's competing biases and reflections and, and lenses that are at play here. So all that means that it's methodologically inappropriate <laughs> and very almost impossible to with validity and reliability include motivation as a measure in the models. Theoretically, it's absolutely important, but because we cannot explicitly model it or with any degree of accuracy document it, it is more useful to think about it as the discussion and what can we say from an exploratory study approach, looking at the actions and the timings and the spatial distribution and those types of movements. So focusing on more on the facts, what can we say then about potential motivations for cultural genocide? Um, we have done our best to include some proxy of that through our coding of state, non-state, other, and unknown actors. Thank you, that's a great question. Thank you, that's a very thoughtful answer to, to that question. And uh, I guess, yeah, it's, it's very complicated when we're talking about uh, motivations and the impossibility simply to map that out. Um, another question is based on your study, what might be some policy recommendations for governments and or humanitarian organizations operating in Syria? 
that is also a very great question. Um, unfortunately, so far, I don't think we have any concrete policy recommendations, uh, with the exception of currently, our analysis does not support a claim that uh, that cultural heritage attacks are a alarm bell for civilian fatalities. That finding is, I, I would recommend it cautiously, but it's, a, it's an important finding because there have been those in the international community who have argued that this hypothesis alone, this sort of alarm bell hypothesis alone, justifies violating sovereign boundaries and the like escalation to a fully fledged international war. So I would say maybe that our study suggests more caution in before making those types of claims. Thank you. Um, here's a question by Nikhil Chandranath, and I'm going to try to rephrase it and hopefully it will make sense to you. From a criminal justice perspective, what kind of actions, vertical or horizontal, would be required to protect cultural heritage? That's a very good question. Um, and there's a lot behind it to answer it. Uh, I'm assuming that vertical implies from a local to a national to an international level. So sort of the like scale of governance here and the horizontal would be more about like on the ground, everyday people, maybe like mobilization. Uh, so correct me if that's wrong. Um, there's a lot <laughs> that can be done uh, if there's political will to do it. There's a lot that also can't be done just because of how our international law framework operates. Um, a lot already has been done it, through our Geneva Conventions, through other international laws, through national laws, but it requires an enforcement mechanism and the willingness to employ it. Uh, and in, in the context of a conflict, that is the first thing to go, understandably. So in the context of a conflict, maybe, I don't know, maybe there are other priorities to start. Maybe there's a way forward here where we can incorporate culture more, more explicitly into those priorities, but it's not really one to start usually. Um, outside of conflict, there's a lot in terms of the market, in terms of uh, due diligence between buyers and sellers and changing the paradigm of how we view aesthetic value to how it interacts with transnational crime. It's a much larger conversation that I'm happy to have offline. Thank you. There's a couple more questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, thank you everyone for this uh, very important presentation. Uh, on an unfortunately very current topic. Uh, and thank you uh, to our attendees for the questions. We hope to see you in the final sessions of this conference. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Always email me if you have more questions. Thank you very much.